Welcome. We've decided to, to stay online this morning, and uh, I looked out the window this morning. It wasn't snowing here in the South Shore, but it is now, which makes me feel glad that we did make the decision. Uh, I thank you for bearing with us, and welcome to those who are able to be with us this way that would have difficulty other ways. And certainly, it's wonderful. Uh, one, one of the lovely things about Zoom is having people from all over uh, you can be anywhere on this small planet and be part of us, as long as you've got the time zone and they're up. So welcome to those further afield. We begin by acknowledging the land upon which we find ourselves here on this part of Turtle Island. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Ganyangahaga, the people of the Flint and that for thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land and the relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We acknowledge that on the traditional territory of the Mohawk, member of the Six uh, Nation Iroquois Confederacy and their stewardship of this land throughout the ages.
perhaps it's my reading into it as much as people read into modern painting, but that sounded like snowfall to me. This morning's service, we will be using the traditions of Teze. For those of you who are not familiar, Teze is an ecumenical monastic community, generally under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Church, but wider than that. It was founded following the Second World War in Burgundy, France. Not far, literally a, a five minute car ride from the ancient Abbey a Great Center of Cluny. So they have found uh, a community that involves uh, open to anyone who wants to be there. The uh, auditorium, the worship space is packed with youth, literally to the rafters and it will hold about a thousand people. And they uh, are there for any length of time and they can, you can stay there and you participate in the work and an, an arts activity and uh, meditating and singing with the monks. Uh, they found that because of its global nature, the best language to use was Latin. So uh, something old became new again and it's still exceedingly popular any time you choose to visit and you're most welcome. So we will be using their music and their understanding of meditation by and large in this morning's service. May the grace of our sovereign Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. From more voices, number nine, Venite Exotemus Domino. you come to transfigure us and to renew us in the image of God. Shine in our darkness. Jesus Christ, light of our hearts, you know our thirst. Lead us to the wellspring of your gospel. Jesus Christ, light of the world, you shine on every human being. Enable us to discern your presence in each person. Jesus Christ, Friend of the poor, open in us the gates of simplicity so that we can welcome you. Jesus Christ, gentle and humble of heart, renew in us the spirit of childhood. Jesus Christ, you send your church to prepare your path in the world. Open for all people the gates of your kingdom. We beseech you now to hear the petitions on behalf of others that we bring before you first in silent prayer.
To these prayers, we add our prayers for peace. There seems so much conflict and turmoil on this planet. For peace in Jerusalem. For peace in Memphis. For peace in the Ukraine. For peace in Peru. For peace here. For that gift of shalom within our First Nations communities as they deal with uncovering yet more graves of children. We pray for wholeness and peace. But with this, we pray for justice, that the truth will be told, that those responsible will be held accountable. That in this world of yours, Holy One, we cannot just do what we wish to do when we wish to do it. That there are consequences. As we face a difficult winter, we pray for those working with those living on the streets for the marginalized, for the working poor increasingly who find it incredibly difficult to cope, to survive. And to governments who offer platitude but little more and explain pandemics and conflicts. but we see the increasing rise of poor in the nations of the world and the obscenity of extreme wealth in its face. And we cry out for justice. We cry out for justice for both genders. For the women on this planet that are denied access to education, to positions, to equal pay for equal work, and for the struggle to change that. We pray for those mourning this day, for whom time seems disjointed. We pray for spiritual comfort for them and the surroundings by a loving community. We pray for those who are suffering of body or mind or spirit. For those who are in recovery. And for those who are awaiting surgery. Oh God, hear our prayers and in your love, answer. For these are the concerns that weigh heavily on our hearts this morning that we now turn over to the grace of Christ. Amen. Benite Sancti, Sancti Spiritus.
Our psalm this morning is Psalm 15, found in Voices United, page 736, with refrain. God, who may be a guest in your house? Or who may dwell on your holy mountain? One who leads a blameless life. Within your holy place, O God, who shall not matter be? One who leads a blameless life who does what is right, who speaks truthfully from the heart. One whose tongue is free from malice, who never wrongs a friend, who utters no reproach against a neighbor. One who cannot respect the unworthy, but honors those who fear God. Who stands by a promise given, though it be to personal disadvantage. One who will not take interest on a loan, nor accept a bribe to testify against the innocent. Whoever does this shall never be overthrown. Our next hymn is found in More Voices, number 100, Lord God, You Love Us, Source of Compassion. As we hear this reading from Matthew this morning, we remind ourselves of the context that we've learned that John the Baptist has been thrown into prison. So Jesus abandons Judea and centers his life around the Sea of Galilee. He's called to this point for disciples and they've left their boats to follow him. And he's gone and taught in synagogues and healed and brought good news. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kind of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Write these words on our hearts, O God. Nothing can trouble. Initially, I was wanting to play off all roads lead to Rome. But thinking about home and how there's no place like home, this image came to mind. And maybe it's better. N nothing wrong with the Appian Way, but the Yellow Brick Road maybe captures more of our imagination. And this Sunday is about imagination. The sermon is about imagination and playfulness and being children of God. So I want you all to tap your ruby slippers, your heels together and say with me, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. We remember this movie, it still captures, it's always played around Christmas time. The youthfulness, the first film that went into Tick the Color, when after that tornado, and Lord knows there's been many going and blowing across the United States this little while, that all of a sudden we're transported to this mag magical place where there's color and Oh, yes, there's struggle between good and evil, but you just have to keep your slippers on and you'll be fine. And the journey with her dog, Toto, when they realize that what, folks? They're not where anymore? Well, the story of the gospel this morning is like that. They're not in Judea anymore. They're not in Jerusalem anymore. I mean, it's fascinating that passage in Matthew where Jesus abandons that area. In other words, there's no way they're going to listen. If they've done that to John, then it's going to be pretty hard to make them hear anything. And so he concentrates his ministry for a while around the sea. And... It's a once in upon a time kind of story this morning. He sees the crowds and then goes up to a mountain and sits down. Now we know in the early church that uh, as I'm seated now, perhaps the interesting thing about Zoom is I'm more like the early church worship service because I'm preaching while seated. And that's how uh, a sermon was delivered. The community stand. Maybe all you want to get on your feet while I'm preaching. And you'll have a flavor of the early church. Probably you won't. But anyhow. But the idea that 
the Jesus is now giving a sermon as they would recognize people hearing that in, within the early church would say, oh yeah, he's going to say something that we need to take note of. And he does. And we know this passage. We know it's in various formats. It's foundational. I can't think myself when I first learned it, but I know that it's been in my mind as a Christian for a long, long time. Next slide. And so he teaches all folk. And if I counted correctly, you can check me. There are seven statements. I don't know if the gospel writers had it in mind that one for each day of the week or that sense of wholeness and fullness of time. But blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, not just persecuted for righteousness sake. And when you're reviled and persecuted and all kinds of evil are you said against you falsely on the account of your faith, on the account of what you believe. Now, we know that the early church would have heard this from their life experience. They, we know that in order to save their lives, they had to, when brought to trial, throw incense on the fire before the statue of the emperor, the god emperor, and recant the god Jesus, the only god. And we know that if they didn't do that, then uh, they had condemned themselves. They were treasonous. So they're blessed when they do this. They're blessed when they're persecuted for righteousness. They're blessed that even in that concept, they're trying to make peace. A peace within the communities and peace within a church that's struggling and having a lot of arguments. And we know from Paul, the church was in conflict. It's always seemed to be in conflict. And yet, when we look at the gospel context, the context where Jesus is preaching, we hear that he has been going around the sea, as I said, and teaching in the synagogues, preaching in the synagogues, and healing and performing wondrous miracles and sights. And the crowds are thronging to him. And that's who is thronging around him, around the disciples. It's like layers this morning. The Jesus on the mount and then the disciples around him, uh, those called at this point, and then the wider community around him. And who are they? Well, they're the ones that are coming to hear good news. They're the ones that are coming to be healed. They're the ones that are coming for a better understanding of life. We talked last Sunday about how the disciples themselves follow Jesus because Jesus is offering them a way out of their life circumstances, out of the meager existence as fishing on the uh, fisher folk on the Sea of Galilee. So they're the ones that very much embody these things. And Jesus is saying, it will be well. It will be okay. With God with you, as God in Jesus, we believe, was with them, the things would be okay. The next slide. The statement is, blessed are. There's the Greek. Akorios, the various forms. But it has a wider tradition and meaning. It's an old statement, and it can mean either blessed or happy. And if attached to the name of divinity, remember Pender or Plato, uh, then more so blessed. But happy, blessed, rejoicing. Remember also the tie with dancing, to rejoice and dance. Same word in Hebrew that there's an aspect of that in the presence of God, there is blessing, there is joy, there is happiness, there is kingdom, there's fullness, there's wonderment, there's enlightenment, 
there's transformation. That's what we sang about earlier, wasn't it? When we started our worship service and we, we prayed about Christ to come to transfigure us and to renew us in the image of God. To transfigure the world we experience, the nature we know, the struggle we have within ourselves. So that deep down within us, we have that shalom, that experience of blessedness and happiness. That all is truly well, really deeply in the world. The next slide. And also we heard from today's day that idea of childhood. That we are called to be transfigured, but to experience the simplicity of childhood. The Beatitudes, as I said, we, we echo in our childhood, but as has been noted by others, that sometimes familiarity breeds contempt, and we don't hear the radical nature of what Jesus was offering. A chance to do things differently, a chance to be a different community, a different world, to start there locally, to expand from there. And that, to some extent, was the mission of the early church, to have those simple beginnings, but to reach and reach and reach until the stories that start that, well, it's even reached to the imperial court and eventually to the mother of the emperor who changes. <laughs> Unfortunately, the church then changed when granted uh, its status and lost that sense of this wonderment and transformative nature of the love of God in Jesus in the community of the Christ. And so you're looking at a child, a painting of a child, in a very simplistic way. And I'm sure most of you have figured out who the painter is. It's Pablo Picasso. No surprise there. No one paints a face like Pablo. But this is a face that he's painting in 1957, not that long ago. And what he's doing is reflecting on one of the most famous paintings in the history of art and certainly in Spanish art. It's the painting of Las Minas, the Maids of Honor painted by Diego Velazquez in 1656. And this is a painting of a princess, the Infanta. Maria Teresa of the Spanish Habsburgs. And in the Velazquez painting, the young five-year-old child is there in this lovely dress. And you see the painter, painter himself, the easel, this huge canvas, and he's painting and reflected to the viewer. And you're looking in on this scene and you see Velasquez painting and the Infanta and those around her. And in the mirror on the wall, you see the King and Queen of Spain reflected. And then another strange figure in the doorway at the end that leads your eye in the perspective. And Picasso uh, does a series of 58 paintings on this theme, meditations on the theme of Las Meninas. Correct me, those who have better Spanish. It's thought that the Velazquez painting was the greatest, and one of the great uh, the, uh, writers on art history writes it, the theology of painting, that painting encapsulates, of the artist reflecting and reflecting the patronage, reflecting the light, reflecting the sun, reflecting the nature of life as it is. And the meditations on that cat Picasso does a series and you can see them in his uh, the museum in Barcelona. He was from Barcelona. And it's the original painting and this series is a line be the line between reality and illusion. And isn't that the theme of the Beatitudes? Uh, the image is pastoral, uh, but where is it? in that time, in that place, or 
a scene that's timeless in all places, that Jesus still sits down in our community and shares that understanding of a transformation of the world and calling us to embrace what? That we're children of God. And that's where we start and that's where we end. And that's all we are. Oh, we struggle so much otherwise, forgetting that simple aspect. And so Picasso shows us the child as if painted by a child. And if you look at a lot of modern art, it's trying to acquire that simplicity of directness and color and childhood imagination. And what better than a princess? I think one of the great things that's happened in the, in the last while is uh, young girls, the, uh, the, and they get the princess dresses. Perhaps you've seen them. And I just enjoy it because it's sort of an antique this style dress. But uh, so often you have the princess dress and then leggings and whatever, running shoes underneath. Uh, not the ruby slippers, sadly. But I can think of situations where I have seen uh, princesses at court. Uh, the uh, one great uh, palace that uh, Louis XIV attended a birthday party there for him and didn't like to see the fact that the Minister of Finance was doing better than the king. And the day after his birthday, uh, 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 put the finance minister in prison and took the palace. And I saw by the long path fountains and the pathways, a young uh, girl dressed as a princess. And I thought, well, yes, uh, what better place to be a princess than, than that, than Vaux-le-Vicomte. But I've seen princesses on the metro. I've seen princesses in an art gallery. Uh, I don't know, where have you seen princesses? It's nice to see young girls imagining and dreaming. And, and for the joy of parents to allow them to have that imagination and playfulness. And for us to have that imagination and playfulness, that we're coming home to who we really are, that the roads are leading us to our proper self, not to our illusionary self of status, importance, of thinkers, of doers, of go on with that. No, of acknowledging that we do have to acknowledge sooner or later and, and often as our years advance and we realize that the other things start to strip away, what are we left with? Who are we left with? If we can embrace that childhood, I think there's a joy. I, I can think of some of our members and I've met others that when you get late 80s, 90s and, and, and beyond, uh, to a certain extent, you can be who you want to be. <laughs> what are they going to do? There's a freedom and a joy about beingness, of recognizing the better, nobler aspects of our childhood. And God leading us into that community of wholeness. Because isn't it the fact of childhood and injustice to childhood that reaches deeper, deepest into our consciousness? and our conscience. I think of that young princess who was on the streets going to school, whose father uh, sent the family to Canada to avoid the war in Ukraine. And she's killed by a speeder getting to work, mindless of where he was, or she was, because I want to widen and just the who the driver was, but that rush to get to work, to be, to do, to be on time, to achieve, that it killed the child. And the stories of we're hearing now of the children who were fed likely bad milk, not what the rest of the world was receiving at the time, not what Ontario society or Quebec society, but uh, raw milk, unpasteurized. And the death of children, the children buried uh, between graves in just wrappings in the cemetery. And that's the deep, deep pain within the First Nations community. It would be there if it were older, but that was to the children that walks us to the core. 
because it's that acknowledgement that that is a world not happy, not blessed, not what God calls us to be. We're called, as we see in the next painting, the next slide, a personage, a character before the sun. I'm sure you saw that instantly, didn't you? Congratulations, you saw that just instantly. You didn't need me to say what the title of this painting was. By Juan Miro in 1968, closer to our time. Isn't it common to say, well, I could paint that? And my answer to that is, well, then why don't you? Well, why don't you <clears throat> express yourself? Uh, release your child and get paint and get messy and put it before others to see. <laughs> the ones who say I could do that seldom do. And Miro, again, more than many, and isn't the true of modern art, the beautiful color and energy and simplicity and vibrancy of the painting that's so immediate. And yet on looking much deeper, White canvas, the gessoed canvas, and Miro uses this because we're called to fill in the blanks. You see, we're called to put our mind, our ideas, our hearing of the Beatitudes into this space and to put a path where every detail won't take us home. We have to use our imaginations and put our part into what is before us. We bask before the sun. That's the image of the painter reflecting the patron and we reflecting the image of God. Where we started with this service this morning that transform us in light of the image of God, that sun before which we stand and bask and enjoy and play. May we truly embrace those beatitudes, not as something so well known we don't hear fresh, but as something that calls us to a greater transformation on our way home. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen and amen. For more voices, 170 Ubi Caritas. of the Holy One. May the divine face shine on you and be gracious to you. And you who are weary and troubled and not at peace with yourself, may you find the road home. Amen.
this concludes our worship service this morning. Thank you for being with us. Your presence is a blessing. And may you experience that blessing in the week to come.